And finally, we get into the cell. Our carbohydrates have been broken down into monosaccharides, primarily glucose. Our proteins have been broken down into individual amino acids. And our fats, through various processes, have finally joined up in the bloodstream and gotten to the cell. And now the cell is able to use these nutrients depending on what the cell needs. We refer to this as metabolic usage. We have catabolic reactions that will go on in the cell. Catabolic is the breaking down of larger molecules into smaller molecules. This involves hydrolysis reaction, hydro meaning water, lysis meaning splitting apart. And actually, this is what a lot of digestion is. It's, high, it's catabolic reactions, taking those large polysaccharides and breaking them down into monosaccharides, taking those long protein polypeptide chains and splitting them with enzymes, energy, and water in a hydrolysis reaction. We also have anabolic reactions where we take these smaller molecules and put them together to make larger molecules. We call these condensation reactions where you use water and water is incorporated in the molecules linking them together. This all depends on what the cell requires. And this balance of catabolic and anabolic reactions we refer to as homeostasis. Homeostasis is a state of balance. The body wants to maintain balance. We'll talk about, for example, with blood sugars. If your blood sugars go up, your body will produce insulin to bring it down. If your blood sugars go too low, then your body will release glucagon that targets the liver to bring release glucose and bring it back up. But perhaps a easier example to think of right now is if your body internal temperature goes up, you bring that back down by sweating and releasing that heat. If you're cold, you bring the temperature up by shivering. Those are reactions that go on in the body to maintain homeostasis. So we're going to look at what goes on inside the cell when these nutrients get into the cell. We'll talk about what's going on in the short term, intermediate, and long term. But first, let me talk to you about the economics of feasting. And this gives me a chance to look at my son who was just visiting and making us food. Hi, Jeffrey. We will look at what happens when you consume excess protein, excess carbohydrate, and excess fat. Here we are in Austin, Texas, eating all of those from a place called Gordo's. These are incredible donuts. And yes, indeed, we got excess protein, excess carbohydrate, and excess fat. You may not be able to see it on this particular picture, but I believe I got the one called Heavenly Hash. Whichever the one was the most chocolatiest, I assure you, that's the one I got. So I call this the feasting stage. When you're when your body gets more calories than it needs or when it, that it can use, we call this the feasting stage. So if we look on the left, carbohydrates, fats, and protein, these, car these nutrients are broken down through the digestive process that we just went through. Carbohydrates into glucose, fats into fatty acids, proteins into amino acids. The carbohydrates that aren't being used for energy are stored in the liver but we have a limited capacity to store carbohydrate as glycogen in the liver and the muscle. Once those stores are full, those excess carbons form fat. Excess fat will be also stored in the adipose cells as fat. When you consume excess protein, after proteins have been broken down into amino acids, once they've been used for their functions, the nitrogen will get excreted in the urine and those excess carbons will form fat. Any macronutrient consumed in excess of what the body needs will be stored in the adipose cells as fat. The opposite of feasting is fasting and we break fasting down into short-term and long-term fasting. For our purpose let's say a short-term fast is two to three days and a long-term fast is seven days. So in a short-term fast the body will first draw on liver muscle glycogen stores, and body fat. 
Remember, the body prefers to use glucose for energy. So the liver and muscle glycogen will be used for broken down to glucose, a hydrolysis or catabolic reaction. And the body fat will be broken down. Those triglycerides will be broken down into glycerol, which can be used to form glucose. We'll talk about that actually when we talk about fitness and fatty acids. These glucose and fatty acid molecules will be used to provide energy for the brain and central nervous system in the short term. As the body moves into a longer term fast, and I apologize, the top of the slide is cut off. It says, if the fast continues beyond glycogen depletion, all right, because what's missing from this slide is glycogen. We only have the ability to store glycogen in our liver for maybe 24 to 36 hours. Once those glycogen stores are depleted in a short-term fast, the body will draw on protein for energy. Depending on how much fat stores you have, the body will continue to use fat for energy. Protein will be broken down or hydrolyzed or catabolized into individual amino acids. We will get rid of that nitrogen because the body can't use nitrogen for energy. Those carbons will be converted to glucose, which will be used for the brain and central nervous system. The body will also use amino acids to provide ketones, which is not what the body prefers to use, but during a fast, whether it's a keto diet and a voluntary fast or because you are lacking in calories, we will, we will make ketones. The body fat will also continue to be broken down into fatty acids, and these fatty acids will be chopped up into two carbon molecules, and they will also form ketones. These will be used for energy, and whatever is not being used for energy, these fatty acid fragments as ketones will be excreted in the urine. So we have short-term fast and long-term fast. And you should know the difference between the energy or fuels that are being used in these 